Hello, good morning. So I'm going to try to share. Hello, good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to give a talk here. Um, so as you just said, I'm going to talk about the Esquid code, which is mainly used for making initial data. And that's really what I'm talking about today. And that's a code that was mainly developed by me, but there's also a lot of other people have contributed uh, pieces here and there, and their names are listed down below here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, here's a quick plan of my talk, what I wanted to talk about, hopefully I get through it. Um, so first I'll show you the uh, initial data equations for binary neutron stars. That's basically the main application for the SQL code. We want to construct initial data for binary neutron stars. Um, so I, I show the equations and give some ideas where they might come from. And then I go into some detail about how you actually solve such equations. I will say a little bit about pseudo-spectral methods, which SQL uses. I will say something about cubed shear coordinates, about newton raphson, raphson methods, and sort of the, the real nuts and bolts that are used to solve such a problem. Um, and then I'll show some results from some simulations we've done with this kind of initial data, so binary neutron star simulations. And then uh, after that, I'll show a little bit uh, even of the program. So because, you know, I thought that's a, a, a toolkit talk, so you can show a little bit of that. And then I'll say a bit about the future plans that we have with this program with Esquid. And after that, I give a summary. All right, so now I, I really start. So what we want to talk about is binary neutron stars. Um, and you know, when they're in a binary, um, there's gravity between them. So they, they go around on some kind of orbit. And the, the binary neutron stars that were observed even before we observed gravitational waves from them, most of them are actually, um, they had a pretty large distance. So they would take millions of years before they spiral in. Um, but for numerical relativity, what we want to do, we want to have them relatively close because we, we cannot simulate millions of years because our simulations run slower than real physics time. So that would be impossible. And that means we want to bring them really close. So we need to make initial data when the two, bi when the two stars are fairly close, maybe 50 kilometers apart as an order of magnitude or something like this. Yeah, but nevertheless, when they, when they are close, it, however far they are actually, they will radiate uh, gravitational waves as we all know, which means they will lose energy, momentum and angular momentum. And it, uh, one of the features of gravitational waves is that they circularize orbits. That means even if you, like billions of years ago, as you started on an elliptic orbit, uh, over time, it becomes more and more circular. So when we simulate it, most of the time, we want to simulate orbits that are practically circular, circular except for that they spiral in. That means the, the, the circle is slowly shrinking. And then if you look at uh, time scales, um, when, you, when they are, say, 50 kilometers apart or something like this, then the orbital time scale is pretty fast. It's on the order of six milliseconds. And when you think about it, that uh, neutron stars, they, I mean, pulsars are neutron stars. We, we have, uh, they're millisecond pulsars. That means they can spin on the same sort of time scale. That means uh, the spin might be important and is actually important because it occurs, the, 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 the rotational period due to spin is about the same order of magnitude in time as the orbital period. And that's why I've drawn sort of spin vectors on these stars. So these stars are allowed to spin. Of course, they, have, they might have different masses. And as you know, so they orbit around each other and eventually they will merge. But we want to set up initial data where they are fairly close, but not merged yet. And for that reason, as I said already, we want to look at, <clears throat> at least for this talk, we want to look at uh, orbits that are pretty much circular, except that they slowly shrink in radius. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, for this to happen, uh, we make a, a couple of approximations. Like, so one thing we consider is an approximation we make, and it's certainly a valid approximation as long as they haven't merged yet, is that the orbital time scale is much shorter than the in spiral time scale. It's nothing but saying that that circle is uh, a very slowly shrinking circle, which means if you look at a single star, I mean, this is a binary, but if I look at one of them, when it moves through space time, which is sort of drawn in a cartoon here, it will move on circles in space. And of course, also forward in time, so you get this kind of helix uh, through space time. That's how a star moves. Both of them move like this. I've just shown one here. And of course, that helix has some sort of tangent vector that's called uh, chi here actually xi, uh, uh, xi, whatever you can pronounce this. Um, and <clears throat> this, this vector is, um, one can sort of use this as an approximation. One can say this is approximately a killing vector. It means if you follow this vector, nothing changes along this vector. Why does nothing change? Because if you follow that star, if you go with the star, then the gravitational field of that star and the other one also does not change. And so this is an approximation you can make is that Along this vector, if you take the liderative of, say, the, the four metric, it's approximately zero. 
Yeah, and this, this vector that we are talking about here that we use sort of as an approximate killing vector, um, it has, of course, like two main directions. It goes, it points forward in time because it's along this helix that goes up in time. And also it has some sort of um, uh, component that goes along the circle. It's written here like that. And that's one of the approximations you want to make when you construct initial data that you, this is some sort of equilibrium condition um, that this is true. Um, another approximation where the stars are spinning, and as I said, we would like to include spin, um, is that uh, one can show, for example, from post-Newtonian calculations, that the spin over an orbital period is roughly constant. The spin vector shouldn't really change, or, but and this would be an approximation that it doesn't change much. Um, so you might want to say that, okay, nothing changes along that killing vector, uh, so you can make all derivatives equal to zero. Uh, and that would be nice if you could do that because that would make everything much simpler. And it, it turns out that the derivative of the metric you can assume to be zero in a good approximation. The derivative of sort of matter quantities like the enthalpy or the matter density you can assume also to be zero approximately along the scaling vector. But the one thing you cannot assume to be zero and it's actually the fluid velocity. The reason is sort of in this cartoon here um, where uh, I show a star with a spin and it, then, it, then it's done a quarter orbit. So I show it again with the spin, which presumably hasn't really changed. And when you go then, when you look at this point that's called P here, the blue point, it's pretty much on the spin axis. Um, and <clears throat> when, uh, when you look at the rotational component of the fluid velocity for that point that comes from the spin, it's pretty much zero because there's not, since you're on the spin axis, you don't see much rotational movement due to spin on that point. Is that a question? Why was a noise? Hello? No? Okay. So I am assuming that everybody's still there. Um, yeah, so what I was saying there is not. No problem. No problem. No problem. Okay, good. It was just some noise. Okay, so there is, uh, as I said, there is not much uh, spin motion for that point, but if you follow the killing vector, that point P would become that point P prime. And then you see that is no longer on the spin axis. And therefore you would see there is now due to the spinning motion, there is quite a considerable motion at that point, which means uh, if you take the liderative, if you assume the liderative um, of, of the three velocity of the star is zero, that would not be a very good approximation. Now, but one can fix this. One can split, split the three velocity, which is written here um, into two pieces, an irrotational piece and a rotational piece. And then for the irrotational piece, the assumption that the iterative along the killing vector is zero uh, still holds, and then it doesn't hold for that piece. But um, you you can write down extra uh, approximations for this one. Basically, you, you assume that the spin is constant, uh, and then you can write down a relation for this one too. And this way, you can then arrive at reasonable equations. I'm not going through the details. I'm just telling you the few things that you need to do. That most iteratives are zero except for one, the one of the three velocity. But then you split it up into two pieces, and the leader of this blue piece is also zero, and then the last piece you deal with in a different way. Okay, so that's basically the, the summary of that slide. That's what we want to do. Um, and then, of course, uh, we want to solve the initial data equation. Uh, and as Helvi just talked about, so there are these two, these equations come from the Hamiltonian momentum constraints, and we will use a particular formulation of these. We will use the so called conformance in sandwich approach. And then we arrive at a bunch of equations, which I have on the next slide. So I'm not going to derive them at all. So they are here. I'll say a bit more in a few moments. And just to remind you where they came from, the approximations that we make to write down these equalities here is that we assume that um, the orbits are approximately circular on an orbital time scale, and that the spins are constant over an orbital time scale. These two things go in there, and then we come up with these equations. Um, and so these are at least the first four equations that are listed here. Uh, they have second derivatives in them. Right? Yes, here's a second derivative operator, and there's, there's this one is also the derivative operator, and there's a second one. And here are two Ds, so everything has second derivatives. So, and for that reason, uh, these things are called elliptic type equations, and they have only spatial derivatives. All time derivatives are gone, as we seen in the previous talk. There, when you talk about initial data construction, you uh, you have only spatial derivatives. All right. Um, and here, this is here again appears this rotational and rotational velocity piece. And so these these four equations they are all of elliptic type. And then we arrive we have one more equation here that doesn't have second derivatives and it's more like an algebraic equation. And what this last equation says it basically says 
for given fields, like these are all fields, like these, this is a conformal factor or shift or lapse and stuff like this. They're all essentially gravitational fields and also some velocity field. For given fields of that sort, you can then compute uh, the enthalpy and the enthalpy is sort of the matter quantity you need here. All other matter quantities like the density or the pressure or anything else can be derived from this one. All right, so uh, that means you have elliptic equations and you have also one algebraic equations. Um, and now the question is, how do we actually solve this? Uh, I'll, I'll come to this in, on the next slide. But before I do that, I want to also say that there are certain uh, parameters in there that are freely specifiable. And the, the physical ones I've listed here, uh, two of them would be the star masses, obviously. There's also a separation you can give between the stars. And then there's uh, a third thing, and it's this omega spin for both stars. And that has to do with the rotational velocity that's here uh, split into these two pieces. So the green piece, that's the rotational velocity, I should say, there you simply prescribe some omega cross r. And that's basically the spinning motion of the star. And you choose that omega here. So basically, this is how you give the star a spin. You choose some omega for each star, and then, then it has a particular rotational velocity. And this irrotational piece, that you compute from the equation above. So you don't specify that. Right, so in this way, you can spe specify, uh, so basically uh, the spin uh, angular velocity of each star you can specify, but not the spin directly. Okay, so these are the equations. And now, of course, the question is, um, how do we solve them? Uh, I should say that the structure of the equations is pretty similar to the irrotational case where you don't have spin. So we can use similar numerical methods. And what we actually do is, is some so sort of large overall iteration. So we have, uh, we basically iterate and then refine the solution more and more. And in order to, uh, to iterate, you have to have a starting point and we need some initial guess. And usually we use a really simple initial guess. We uh, use a TOV star, that's a non-rotating star. We use that for each one of them. So we put each one of these stars into sort of this non-rotating spherical state, which is not going to be the final thing because for binaries, they will be deformed. They also are supposed to be spinning. So this is just some, some initial stage guess and then we have to refine it. Um, and the way we find it is that given that particular matter distribution for these stars, this, this encapsulated by this H, um, you can compute all the other things from the elliptic equations that I mentioned. So the first few equations. Once you've done this, you can then update the H because the H depends on all these from via the last equation, this algebraic equation. And then you iterate over this over and over until it doesn't change anymore. You come up with some tolerance criterion, like if, if things don't change anymore by a certain amount, then you say, okay, I'm done now, I've converged. Yeah? And so this, this is basically the overall iteration that we have to do when we want to solve this problem for binary neutron stars. Yeah, but as I said, to so the first step in this iteration is solving the equations. So we need to have a good, efficient way to solve elliptic equations. And that's what I'm, going, what I'm going to talk about next. And of course, these equations, if I go back, they have first and second derivatives. So you need a good way to calculate derivatives that's efficient and presumably accurate, or like hopefully accurate. Okay, so that's the next thing I'm coming to. And this is what we're going to do with a spectrum method. We're going to use a spectrum method to compute our derivatives. So I want to explain that also a little bit. Um, so, um, in, so what's done here, this first equation is, I, I'm doing it first in one dimension. So I have a U of X, some field, one of them that I need to solve an elliptic equation for maybe. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to expand it in a set of basis functions that I call FL here. Um, and I'm not going to use infinitely many, I'm using a certain finite number of them. And in front of them is a coefficient. Yeah? And so that's basically it. When you talk about a spectral method, you expand whatever you have in a set of basis functions, and then you get a set of coefficients instead. And then once you have this expansion, then it's relatively easy to take derivatives because now if you need to take an extra derivative of your u of x, you can just uh, uh, act with this derivative operator on the right-hand side. And the right-hand side has only x dependent in the basis function. This coefficient, as far as x is concerned, is, is a constant. Um, and then me that means you need to take derivatives of your basis function. But that is analytically known, this basic fu basis function. And therefore, you can take analytic derivatives and you can just write down what this is, and you only need the coefficients. Okay, and that would be a spectral method if you basically store in your program the coefficients. What we do, we actually use a pseudo spectral method. Um, and in this one, uh, instead of storing all these coefficients, we store instead um, the values of that u at certain grid points, at, at certain collocation points. I call them here uj. These are simply the values of u at these points. Um, 
And these are points that you introduce in, uh, depending on what basis function you use, you use different kinds of sets of points. For example, if you had a Fourier basis, which is a possibility for, an, for a basis function, right? if you have one of these complex exponentials, this is also the simplest thing, you can have four bases, uh, then you would e use equally spaced uh, collocation points, so grid points. Yeah? Um, and so then uh, you may wonder, so why are we using our grid points instead of coefficients? Well, one reason it maybe it becomes more similar to find a different thing, but that wouldn't be a good enough reason. The real reason is that if, if we have nonlinear terms, if we need a u square or something like this, if you have to value at the grid point, you can simply multiply the fit itself and you immediately get u square. So it's easy to compute nonlinear terms. Well, if you were doing this with coefficients, you would need some sort of convolution and it would get more complicated. Yeah? But altogether, the difference between like storing values, I mean, for coefficients or values on grid points is not very big because you can go, go between the two. Right, so because we have this basis expansion, this works for any x, so it also works on a grid point. So you have this relation between ul tilde, the coefficient, and uj, the field at the grid point, that holds like this. That means there's a linear relationship between the two. Um, you can represent this as a matrix multiplication, or sometimes as a fast Fourier transformation, depending on your basis functions. Um, which means going back and forth between those two is actually easy. It's done via a matrix, as shown here, at least in principle. And this matrix is invertible. Um, and also, one can show that if you take these derivatives of the basis functions, you can write this also in terms of the matrix. So basically, if you need the derivative at the grid point, you would simply multiply uh, the value at all the grid points of a particular matrix that I call D here, some sort of differentiation matrix. matrix. And these matrices can be pre computed and they're known ahead of time. They simply depend on your grid points and your basis functions. And those are fixed. Um, so, and then basically you take uh, um, derivatives by looking at uh, the values of the grid points. This is similar to finite differencing. The, the difference is for finite differencing, you would take only neighboring grid points, maybe next to nearest neighbors even, but you wouldn't take all grid points. You would take some of them. While for this spectrum method, you use simply all grid points. This, this matrix here is full. And that's why uh, it can be a better approximation because you, you take the, into account the values on all grid points, so you can get a more precise derivative. Okay, so that's basically the essence of a uh, pseudo spectral method. Uh, you use it for taking derivatives. Now, um, this was all done here in one dimension. Uh, the, the extension to three dimensions is really straightforward. You sort of take a product basis. You take a basis function in x, y, and z directions and you take simply the product. And in your coefficients, for example, they have then three indices, but otherwise it's the same. And that's the kind of product basis we actually use in the S grid code. Okay, so that's one part of it. Now, that's, I, I talked now about the spectral method. And the good thing about the spectral method is, uh, and that's why people like to use it, is that these coefficients, uh, if you go to the higher coefficients with the higher L or M, um, they drop off exponentially if your field is smooth. If your field is C, what's called C infinity, um, then you get this exponential drop off. This means you don't need very many coefficients. You can get a, a wave of just taking a few, which corresponds to also taking just a few grid points, it's the same. Um, and then uh, that's then very efficient, of course. But this only works if your matter field is totally smooth. If it's not, then it drops off faster and potentially drops off very slowly. And then you need a lot of coefficients or a lot of grid points, and then the method would not be efficient. And so in our problem, the matter that, for example, is smooth inside the stars, outside the stars, there's no matter, but there is this, uh, there's the surface of the star. And across the surface, um, the matter variables are not smooth. Uh, not all the derivatives are well defined even. Which means if you were to use a single domain and then put your star somewhere in the middle of that domain um, and then use a spectral method, it would not perform very well because you have this non-smooth uh, region, sorry, the star surface, and uh, then all this effort using a spectral method would be for nothing. And that's the reason why I'm coming to the next step. We then introduce surface fitting corners, which means that we basically split our region of interest, so basically the, the two stars in the region around them, into many domains, such that in e within each domain, the matter is smooth. And that is uh, any known smoothness is at, uh, when you go from one domain to another, but not within the middle of the domain. That's basically the point. That's what we want to do. Yeah, and then within each domain, we can expect the spectral convergence where the coefficients drop off quickly. And then we don't need too many. And we don't need, then we don't need many grid points. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, so now, <clears throat> uh, let me see. 
Yeah, so now I'm coming basically to this, how do we do this? It's domain decomposition that we had, that we have this property. Yeah, so here, what's shown here is this, this round thing here in the middle is the star. And we're covering it now with many domains. And the main point is that there has to be a domain boundary at the surface of the star. Yeah, for example, this green domain, this, this one would contain the matter still. And when you go over to this pinkish domain, there you wouldn't have matter. And that's uh, along that surface, there would be this non-smooth behavior of the matter. Um, and how do we cover this uh, star like this? Well, we basically take our Cartesian coordinates we start with and take, do a coordinate transformation on them so that we get coordinate lines a little bit bent like this. And the transformation actually is shown here on the top for this green wedge, for example, it's, this is the transformation. We, instead of x, y, z coordinates, we now introduce new coordinates, lambda, a, and b, I call them, that they have a certain range. Um, and within these transformations, there are some functions a, which depend on some sigmas. And these sigmas are used to specify the shape of the surface, because this has to work not only for spherical stars, but it has to work for deformed stars. Like in the binary, there will be tidal deformations and spin deformations and all that stuff, so the star will not be spherical. But we can do that in this transformation by specifying this function sigma that depends on these a and b coordinates that basically have arbitrary surfaces here so that the um, transition from one domain can happen anywhere depending on where your star ends basically and that's how you cover one star uh, by several domains and then if you need two stars you put two of these things next to each other and then of course you need to cover the surroundings by more of these wedges and i haven't even shown of them all we use a lot of them um, in fact for this problem, we, we tend to use 38 of these domains. Yeah. Um, so that, and that's actually the only downside of this method that you need so many domains. But other than that, it's, everything is fairly simple because this is a simple coordinate transformation, simple enough that there is no coordinate singularities in it. And also we can invert it analytically, which is also very useful to have. Yeah. So the only sort of caveat is that we need a whole bunch of domains. And of course, between any of these two domains, we need boundary conditions. These are not physical boundary conditions. They are simply boundary conditions on how is the field related on one side to the field on the other side. Uh, they only exist because if you introduce these artificial boundaries. And so the, on these interdomain boundaries, you have to give conditions. And since you have I don't know, 38 domains that are all touching, you have a lot of boundaries to talk about. And it would be tedious to impose boundary conditions sort of by hand on all of them. But we have automated this in Escrit. So Escrit now finds the boundaries and automatically imposes the correct boundary conditions across them. And the correct boundary condition that we use is that the field is continuous across the boundary and its normal derivative is also continuous about, across the boundary. That's pretty much all we need. Okay, and that's basically uh, what we do in terms of spectrum methods and coordinates that we use to have efficient spectrum methods. Um, and then, of course, we need basis function. I told you already that we need to expand in some basis. Um, and uh, I started with x, y, z coordinates that looked like Cartesian, but really what we do, the coordinates that we use for our, when we write down our basis functions are not those, but we use our, the ones that we transform to, the lambda a and b coordinates, those we use to write down our <clears throat> basis functions. And what we do for this problem, we use Chebyshev polynomials as a basis. We use it in all three directions, so in lambda, a, and b. And here are the Chebyshev polynomials written down, what they look like. Uh, they depend on, you know, this is a basis function, it depends on some index l, and that looks like this. Um, one could also use, say, Fourier basis. I mentioned this already. That would be good for periodic direction. But in our case, the domains we have, there's nothing periodic there, so you wouldn't use Fourier. And then, of course, you need collocation points. And the collocation points that usually go together with these championship polynomials are these kind of points. So as you can maybe see, they're spaced with a cosine function. So they are not equally spaced, like you would probably use in finite differencing. These are unequally spaced points that sort of bunch up towards the boundary. Yeah, but they are, they are known. There's an analytic formula for them. So you, you can easily calculate them, easily use them. OK, so these are the basis function and collocation points we use. Um, and then, uh, once we do all this, we then have to solve our system of equations. All right, and uh, so the system of equations, the, both the elliptic equations and also our boundary conditions, they're sort of of this form, that, that you have some function that depends on the fields u, the first derivatives, and also the second derivatives, and that has to be zero. And the fields here are, that I'm talking about are the ones where we have elliptic equations for, so this will be the conformal factor, the lapse, the shift, and the velocity potential, stuff like that. <clears throat> And so what we do now, we introduce our collocation points, as I talked about. Um, and then we also approximate our derivatives with these 
instead of having a derivative operator, you have now a matrix multiplication of the vector that's made up of the field and all the midpoints. Um, that's what you do for your collocation points and all that. Uh, the last thing I should talk about the fields that we have are these that are mentioned here. One of them is actually a vector, all the others are scalars. And when you have a vector and you need to express its component, you need to wonder which coordinate system to use for that. And actually to express that vector, we actually stay with Cartesian coordinates. That's what we do. Uh, these coordinates have an advantage that there will never be a coordinate singularity in them. And also the equations are slightly more simple when you write them down in sort of Cartesian-like coordinates. Um, but that means we need to take derivatives um, when we stay with Cartesian coins, we need to stay, take extratives of this beta, for example. But we can easily do this with the chain rule, and that's shown here. But right? even if you naturally, with the uh, spectral method, you would take lambda derivatives or so a derivatives of this, you can easily get extratives out of this by using a chain rule. Right? You take a lambda derivative, and then you take the lambda by the x, and you take an a derivative and the a by the x. It's just chain rule. And this the lambda by the x and the a by the x, they are known again analytically. There's nothing numerical I need to do about them. This is simply coming from the coordinate transformation, which was specified earlier. Okay, <clears throat> so if I put all this together, inserted in these equations, <clears throat> I then get uh, a new set of equations, which is uh, given now at each grid point. So instead of having a whole bunch of partial differential equations, I have now a whole bunch of algebraic equations, one at each grid point. And since I have a lot of grid points, I get a lot of these equations. Um, and that field in U that appears in here now depends now only on the values of all the fields and on all the grid points. So these uh, subscripts here label the grid points. Okay, and that would be all my uh, elliptic equations and boundary conditions. They look like this. And then, as I mentioned, there's also sort of an algebraic equation that we need to use to update the matter when we iterate. Um, and that we can also formulate and write down on these grid points. Yeah, but we still do an iteration when we first solve these sort of uh, this type of equation, which come from uh, PDEs. And then we solve this other equation here by updating. And we do that over and over, as I mentioned earlier. All right. <clears throat> so that's, what, that's, that's how we actually uh, intend to solve the equations. And so now I'm giving you even a few more details on how we actually do this. Um, so the first thing I should say, we iterate anyway. I mentioned this already, yeah, because we have to update the matter fields period, like, yeah, after each elliptic solve, we update them and we go again and do this over and over. And since we iterate anyway, it's not really worth to solve this full system here all at once. You could, they're all coupled in principle, so in some sense you should solve them all at once, but if you iterate, you can also solve them one after another and then basically iteratively find the true solution. And that's what we actually do. So this full set of equations here, um, we, instead of solving it all at once for all the fields like psi or beta, uh, we solve it one after another. Um, and that means instead of one big set of equations, we get five sets of that are smaller, which is advantageous. Yeah? And on these smaller sets of equations, we still have to solve them one after another. We use a so-called Newton-Raphson scheme to solve this because this is just an algebraic equation now for psi, for example, the first one, or for any of these fields, which are called U in general. And a Newton scheme is a simple scheme where you basically start up with an initial guess and then you refine it. You basically take your U old and add something to it and get the U new. And this is just to solve one of these. Uh, and in, as in any Newton step to get this X here, this update, you need to solve a linear equation as well, which comes simply from the derivative of whatever function you have here with respect to your field, which I call U here. And this is, is, is a given thing. Uh, this is basically the UO that you insert here and on the right hand side as well. So this is simply a linear equation for X that you solve uh, with a linear solver. Of course, since this happens often because it's inside a Newton solver that's inside an iteration, um, you need to have something that's efficient here. And what we do, we use a GMRES solver, which this GMRES stands for, this is an iterative solver, it stands for generalized minimum residual method. And that's simply a, a well-known method. And the particular one we used, I've, this is publicly available. I've gotten it from here, from netlib.org. Um, now, uh, there's one more caveat. This is, a, this is just a linear solver and it's iterative. And for it to work well, it needs a so-called preconditioner, which means it's an, you need an approximate inverse of this thing. Not a full inverse, because that would be meaning solving the full problem, but just an approximate one. So that's the last thing we need to do in S squared. We need to find an approximate inverse of this matrix here. This is really a matrix. Um, and we do that with what we call a block Jacobi method, which means we just 
um, take the, the matrix is, is a big matrix. There's a lot of entries. And we keep only some entries of this matrix uh, that are near the diagonal. Certain blocks near the diagonal we keep, and everything else we throw away. And then it becomes easier to invert because then you just invert each block individually. And that's also parallelizable then. Um, and that's what we really do. And that gives us an approximate inverse. And this approximate inverse we then use as the precondition for the G inverse method, which then gives us this linear solution, which can be Five used minutes. for other step. Five minutes. Thank you. Okay, so that's what we really do. And here are now, um, I think I talked enough about what we really do. Here are now some results. <clears throat> this is done for um, an equal mass system where we have two stars that, have, that are fairly heavy. Um, and we set up the initial data for them. <clears throat> this is now without spin actually, but these stars are very compact. And here you can see now when you uh, simulate this with an evolution code, like the BAM code, they spiral into each other. These are the trajectories of each star. You also get nice looking gravitational waves where basically the wave signal ramps up slowly and then you merge, you get the maximum. And it then dies down very quickly in this case is because these two stars are so heavy that when they merge, they basically immediately form a black hole and then the black hole just shrinks down. That's why you see very little in this case. The main point why I'm showing you this, we can reach very high compactness in this case. You're pretty much close to the maximum compactness possible with this equation of state. So the code can reach high compactness. That's what you're trying to say here. We also can reach high spin. This is a similar, this is showing uh, there was the spin parameter that we have. When we increase it, we get more spin and we can do that, increase it further and further. This is again for an equal mass system, this time with spin along the orbital and momentum direction. Um, and we can see we can reach a sort of maximum spin. There's no points beyond that. That's because the code stops working beyond that. But the reason why it stops working, I think shouldn't be surprising because we get here close to breakup. If I spin a star more and more, eventually we'll fly apart. And that's exactly, we reach this point. We go actually even slightly below that, no, uh, we go slightly beyond that point. So this is just to say that we can reach high spins with this program. And I think I'm gonna skip this one. We can also have mass, different mass ratios, then you get different looking spirals that have different sizes, but we can also do high mass ratios. I wanted to say, since I have a few minutes left, uh, in those few minutes, I wanted to say um, a little bit uh, about what's in Esquid. Um, so it's written in pure C, it's open and P parallelized, and it's modular. So it has a main part in which uh, all these numerical methods are in, like Newton Raffles and all those ways to take derivatives, coordinate transformations, all that kind of stuff. And uh, in addition, for each physics problem, it has a module, like for example, for this binary neutron star problem, there's an extra model. And both of these are controlled by parameters. Um, and I wanted to show you a few things on how this is actually done. Uh, for an example. The example I wanted to show is not the binary neutron star example because this one's damn complicated. The whole project is damn complicated in some ways. I'm just showing you what would happen if you had two coupled elliptic equations to solve. Just some example. These are two nonlinear equations that I've coupled. There's some nonlinear terms in here. Um, and so these are the equations. And as I said already, uh, in this Newton step, we also have to solve linearized equations. So we linearized them, we look like this. And in order to solve all this now, um, you um, have to code up this somehow. And this is done in sort of two main function, uh, two main C files in the S-grid. One of them is sort of a, a main file that schedules when we do what and defines variables and parameters. And the other one uh, as sort of implements these equations in, in, in fact. And I just wanted to quickly show you what they look like. They, I have not shortened them by much here, just a little bit. Uh, so they fit on one page. Uh, basically, you schedule certain functions in certain time bins, so something happens and you also give a comment to whoever reads this program to understand what's going on here. And this is, the, this, for example, is the function that actually solves the elliptic equations. And you also specify what variables are at, like, for example, you have psi, uh, and you give a comment, hopefully, and you also have to specify the derivatives, and you give some parameter, you also specify what parameters you want in the problem, like, uh, like how many iterations you want to do. And this is just an example problem, as I'm saying. So that's this, this control file, so to speak, that, that does tell you what to do. And then how to do it is here. There's these two functions that actually code up the equation. I don't have much time. So I'm just going to tell you, here's the coded up the uh, nonlinear equations and here are the linearized equations. So you basically find these directly in there within some for loops that loop over that can be open and p parallelized. All right, so and now I'm coming sort of, since I seem to have only five minutes, I was told, um, coming towards the end. So future plans uh, that we have for s -grid is that, so we recently obtained an NSF grant to make s -grid public, so that's the plan. 
And we are collaborating on this with Roland Haas because we want to um, make it available for the Einstein toolkit as well. So the plan we have, we will provide the main part of SQL that has all these numerical solvers. Um, and we will also provide some examples like this POS solver 3 I've just talked about so that people can look at how this one solve elliptic equations in case they want to do their own. And we will also provide, and it's probably of most interest, this DNS data module that makes binary neutron star initial data. And we also plan to give them documentation for all of these things. And since SQL is sort of its own separate code, we want to make an initial data reader for the Einstein toolkit. So it can read uh, initial data that's created by SQL. It, it writes some sort of data file and that needs to be read by the Einstein toolkit. And then to test all this, we want to also perform some simulations with the Einstein toolkit and also for comparison with other codes like BAM or NMesh to just see that we're doing the right thing. We will also provide some Python scripts that will help with eccentricity reduction and we intend to, if you have the time, to add cold equation of state support to s in terms of tables. It already has cold equation of state uh, support for piecewise polytropes, but we just want to add arbitrary tables. And this is work that uh, my new postdoc, Michael Pirog, will work on. Um, okay, so these are the future plans, and here's the summary of the talk. So we can create initial data for generic masses and spins pretty much on any orbits. We can reach high spins, high masses, and high mass ratios, which was difficult in the past. And uh, we plan to make all this publicly available with documentation. And we plan to make an Einstein thorn so that anybody can load this kind of initial data and simulate this. Anybody has access, any, pretty much anybody can use the Einstein toolkit. So it's totally public after that. So that's the plan. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and for inviting me. Great. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, Roland. <laughs> Anyone else has a question? So, yeah. um, thank you very much for the description of how the algorithm works. Um, whoops, to do the spectral ones, you said you have to have a surface fitted coordinate system. And when I try this, I always have trouble actually keeping the surface fitted coordinate at the surface of the star as I do my solves. Um, do you find it very troublesome? Do you have any secret sauce that makes this work for you? I mean, it's not that secret because it's in the paper, um, but it is difficult. Um, basically, you, I mean, it's in principle not hard, right? The star surface is given where the enthalpy is one. So you just have to search for that point. You need a root finder that finds where's this thing one. That is not so hard. Uh, and then you adjust your domains. Basically, to, after that point, you regrid, come up with a new numerical grid that sort of exactly fits this. And then you interpolate from the old to the new grid. So that's in there too. Um, the trouble is sometimes um, that the, the boundary condition for at the star surface is actually sometimes a little bit tricky numerically. There's some numerical instability sometimes. And then when it becomes a little bit unstable, then finding this is tricky. And then sometimes it's better to keep it frozen for a while and not update it and update it only every so often, stuff like this. Uh, but it is not in principle hard. It's just like with any numerics, you have to play around with it for a couple months until it actually works. Uh, yeah. Give What's the typical runtime for setting up binary neutron star initial data was the question. Oh, the initial data. So this depends on resolution. For low resolution for testing, it's just a few hours. If you uh, want the highest resolution that we use for our production runs, uh, I think it depends again what computer you have, but the, 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 the sort of workstations that we have here, it's maybe five days or something like this. It's not fast. Okay, cool. Um, could you just very briefly, um, uh, tell us how you plan to extend the code to enable sort of arbitrary um, orbital adjustments to minimize um, eccentricity. Well, it has that already. So the, it has an it has an omega parameter which gives the angular velocity essentially, and there's also radial velocity you can specify. Uh, okay. So with these two parameters, you can basically have any orbit already. The, the formalism actually works for um, you can have elliptic orbits if you want them, or you can use these parameters to circularize it. Interesting. Um, and then one last question from uh, Nils Vu. Do you damp the newton raphson solver? It's in chat. Do you damp the newton yeah. raphson uh, Yeah, he probably, yes, I didn't mention this. So basically when we when we do the solve, uh, then you might want to update the fields with this new solution that you find, but we actually use only 20% of this and add it to the old one. Uh, so in that sense, we damp it, yes. Because otherwise it doesn't also, again, it doesn't converge. Fascinating. So that's well, in the paper, it's not secret. Yeah, <laughs> never trivial. Thank you so much, Wolfgang, um, for a very insightful talk.